Our next, next speaker is Dr. Malik Badri. Uh, the keynote speech will be given by him about Islamic psychology, past, present, and future. Let's talk a little bit about our professor. Uh, he obtained his PhD from the University of Leicester, England in 1961, and his postgraduate certificate of clinical psychology from the academic department of psychiatry of the Middlesex Hospital Medical School of London University in 1966. He was elected fellow of the British Psychological Society in 1977 and holds the title of Chartered Psychologist in recognition of his contribution to this field. He was dec decorated by the President of Sudan with the Medal of Shahid Zubay, the highest award of academic excellence. Professor Badri is the founder of the modern field of Islamic psychology and he was written, he, writ, he has written many influential books, including The Dilemma of Muslim, Psy Muslim Psychologists, were uh, the one who which was revolutionized and defined the field. Professor Badr is the founder and the president of the International Association of Islamic Psychology. Dr. Malik, the mic is yours. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim wa ba'd. I uh, have put a few points here. Uh, to, uh, but before saying this, I would like to offer my deep thanks and appreciation to uh, the president of this university for his kind words and uh, to be so happy as to see uh, these uh, people like uh, Professor Zubair Bashir and uh, uh, Professor uh, Anis Ahmed, both of them are vice chancellors of universities in their countries. Also to see dignitaries people who have really done a, a lot of work in the field of uh, psychology and Islam. I, uh, I would like to say that uh, I do not believe myself in the sense that in, uh, in the 60s, 1963, when I first gave the first lecture on Islam and psychology, there was a barrage of attack, attack by uh, psychologists, Muslim psychologists who listened to me. Psychology is a pure science. What brings Islam to psychology? After Bunt uh, made his laboratory, and took away psychology from philosophy and religion. You want to bring it back? You want to take us back to uh, superstition? What brings Islam here? Now, this was in 1963. And then now, to see a distinguished uh, lady, uh, Kerry York, in this hall here, an American, is teaching Islamic psychology in Iowa State University. And to see Professor uh, Rashid Skinner giving a certificate in Islamic psychology in Cambridge, it is something which is uh, uh, it cannot be in the age of, uh, I think it's true, I am very old, but I, I, it's not possible for, for one to have this great uh, change that took place. Now, uh, when I wrote this book about, uh, about uh, the dilemma of Muslim psychologists, I spoke about three stages because some people actually work for Islam at that time and a few 
were able to uh, but I was uh, talking about three stages that people pass through the first stage is infatuation infatuation is when you graduate as a psychologist and people come and tell you oh, mashallah you are a psychologist so you know what is in my mind then he's happy you know uh, he fools himself into believing that he has some abilities and he's so happy with psychology we goes into the lab and do some experiments and he thinks he's doing science then after a while he goes into studies of Freudian psychology uh, some of the extreme ideas of Watson about religion and then he feels that this is again is Islam if he's a good Muslim he's going to get into a what psychologists call cognitive dissonance this is something I like psychology I want I'm infatuated with it but at the same time I uh, it is against my religion so he goes into to he solves this dissonance by saying in fact there is no great difference between psychology and Islam uh, even Freud when he said the id the ego and the super ego actually it is the Quran says an nafs al ammara and then the the blaming soul and nafs al lawama and an nafs an nafs is the ego an nafs al ammara is the id and an nafs al al mutmainna is the uh, is the the highest level uh, uh, the e it is the super ego now this is nonsense of course in, in spite of the fact that it was fair is coined by al aqad of egypt but it is nonsense freud believes these are constructs as i say in this room there are three components there is metal there is stone and there is glass so he speaks about constructs of personality but in islam it is not a materialistic it is a spiritual not only spiritual but when you have nafs ammara it's you all of you is nafs ammara you 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 think about doing something uh, which is uh, haram and then your nafs pushes you all of you now is nafs ammara then you say no that is bad why should i do this then all of you will become nafs lawama blaming so but this nafs mutmainna is something that few people can reach it is through continued ibadah feeling consciousness of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and a person is patient as the our rector just now said tawassaw bi sabr it is it really needs a lot of patience to be able to go up the stairs of spirituality and when you reach this then you have nafs mutmainna then when you have bad promptings from a nafs ammara at once your your tranquil soul will know it it is just like a person who is injected with a germ the whole body will know it and will the, the antibodies will will destroy uh, these antigens the the germs the same thing الذين إذا مسهم طائف من الشيطان تذكروا فإذا هم مبصرون when shaitan just touches them with it then at once their whole uh, spiritual and psychic system comes into action and destroys what Iblis had done uh, therefore we have gone through this as a, as a nation as people who want to bring Islam into psychology uh, uh, it started by this uh, 
trying to bring things together, then people will reach a level. The first level is uh, uh, infatuation. The second is reconciliation, trying to make psychology and Islam as if they are similar. But then the last level, the highest, is uh, emancipation. You discover at last that psychology is a, is a subject which is not a science. It is a science in limited areas, areas where psychology and pure sciences come together, like physiological psychology, like uh, uh, behavioral genetics, like this. These are sciences. Or when we use the scientific method in studying social phenomena, this is okay. But we cannot say a, a little baby sucking the breast of his mother is doing a sexual act. We cannot talk about Oedipal complex. We cannot talk. These are all, this is nonsense. Today, a book has been published that uh, the title of which is Freud and Cocaine. And in fact, when Freud wrote all this sexual uh, nonsense, he was actually a drug addict. He was under the influence of cocaine. And we have Muslims, uh, lecturers now for many years, they come and teach psychosexual development and so It is really shameful, really, it was shameful. And indeed, I think these people uh, when I criticized Freud and uh, I got this criticism in Saudi, very late in the 70s, uh, one of them is a wise man who has a broad thinking, an Egyptian, may Allah bless his soul. He told me, Malik, don't be angry with your colleagues, they are angry with you. Because they get their salaries from Freud. If you attack Freud, what will they do? So indeed, in this sense, we, are, we were really faced with, uh, with, with, with people who defend uh, this evil with their, uh, with their uh, thought and their action. And I think that uh, in this respect, one uh, good Egyptian scholar, he said that in fact, the West should be paying our salaries because we are, we are decimating the, his, uh, his worldview and his, uh, his thought. Uh, so back to the um, title of the lecture. I come to the, um, to the past, to our past. And it is a long history. You know who is the very first person to speak Islamic psychology? It was a great lady, a great Muslim lady. Uh, not only a great, but probably the greatest in a number of ways. This woman is Aisha the wife of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in the past she said, if the Quran told the Arabs of Mecca, don't drink alcohol, don't fornicate, don't so and so. If from the beginning the Quran said to them so, they would have said, no, we will never do it. But the Quran fairies avoided this and fairies softened their hearts with talking about the akhirah, about paradise and hell until their hearts softened. And when their hearts softened, they were told to stop taking alcohol and to stop fornicating, and they did it. They obeyed. They obeyed in a way which is astounding. What happened in Medina is something that has never happened in the history of humanity, and I don't think it will happen. A whole nation, city-state, 
they are told to stop taking alcohol and then everybody throws away the alcohol he has in big jars until Medina ran with little rivers of, of alcohol, of khamr. They say in that day, the goats of Medina were drunk because they come and drink what is uh, now, this, how did this happen? It's a miracle. It never happened before, a whole nation. Today, when a psychiatrist is able to treat three or four alcoholics and they do not uh, revert in a month or two, oh, he's congratulated and he writes a paper, I have done so and so. Now, this is a whole nation was, was uh, stopped to take alcohol. How did this happen? Sayyidah Aisha spoke about the positive, how their hearts were softened. But the Quran knows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the humans he created. Therefore, it was not a commandment, don't take alcohol. No, there was graduality. Fairest of all, from the date palms and from, uh, and from grapes, you ferment a drink, which is a uh, 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 is alcohol, but also you, you get good nourishment. It was just a touch. وَمِنْ ثَمَرَاتِ النَّخِيلِ وَالْأَعْنَاقِ تَتَّخِذُونَ مِنْهُ سَكَرًا وَرِزْقًا حَسَنًا Some people with soft hearts began to feel that uh, the good nourishment is, is, is good, is better than the, than the alcoholic drink. A year or two, then uh, the other ayah, they ask you about alcohol and gambling, say in them there are some good for people, but their bad aspects are much more than their good aspects. Then Sayyidina Umar wants everything to be done quickly, comes to the Prophet, tell us something strong about alcohol, stop, make it haram. And then the Prophet says, no, Umar, I was not ordered to do this. You will have to take it step by step. People now know that uh, alcohol, alcoholic beverages, their Bad aspects are much more than their good aspects. Then comes the third and uh, uh, another. Uh, don't say your prayers while you are drunk. You can drink, but when you are drunk, don't pray. So this has been uh, a stricter one. When can one drink? The five prayers come one after the other, one after the other. He drinks, if he drinks, he doesn't, they generally drink in the afternoon and evening. But if he drinks in, during Zuhr, at once us will come. So it, what actually this ayah means, reduce the amount of alcohol you drink. Because they cannot drink up to becoming uh, drunk. And this is very important. At that time, there was no uh, drugs that abate uh, withdrawal symptoms. The only other possibility is to reduce the amount of alcohol in the blood gradually. And when people were ready, then the ayah came, uh, uh, alcohol and gambling are ways of the devil. Don't touch it again. So people responded. Already alcohol has been taken out of their bodies or very much reduced. They were ready to stop. Now this is a miracle of the Quran because Allah created people and knows, knows addiction, knows what is happening in now. So here we are having uh, a very important aspect, graduality and a positive way of, uh, of helping people to, uh, to change. 
these two are in fact the pillars of all psychotherapy today, whether it is cognitive behavior therapy or whatever, people are, patients are to do things gradually and also there must be a form of reinforcement or a reward that comes from, from the change. And this is the basis for all the developments that has happened, all the great uh, uh, contributions of early Muslim scholars started from there, started from the Quran. Uh, we have uh, people who are uh, uh, who are uh, like uh, Al Ghazali, who came up with uh, conditioning at a very early age, uh, telling the person that this cup which is used in bloodletting, it this particular cup, you, its honey is given to you in the cup. You cannot take it because you associate. And he spoke about these associations in great detail. He also spoke about what we call today systematic desensitization in therapy, uh, in which a person who, who used to lose his temper and get angry and merchant, he made him, uh, this man, gradually uh, paid somebody money to come and curse him at home. He wants to get rid of his great angry outbursts. Come and call me bad names. So that fellow comes to the house and calls him bad names, but at the same time, same time he takes his tasbih and remembers Allah while he's listening to himself being cursed. When he, this man repeated this a few days, halas, he, does, he doesn't feel anything. So tomorrow I will bring three of my friends come and curse me in front of them. Gradually, he increased the number of people until he was able to be cursed by this man publicly in the marketplace and he was smiling. All the merchants were surprised because he was known to be the person who had the, the who was the most angry among them. Now, uh, all of a sudden, this great uh, history a history of people like, uh, like uh, al belkhi at that time. He was the first to differentiate between psychosis and neurosis. Nobody before him did this. Madness and psychological disorder. He was the first to use what we call today cognitive behavior therapy. In detail, I must tell you that I, at this moment, in the uh, 21st century, I have made use by translating his work, I have made use of him in helping my own patients today in the management of anger, in the management of this, that, because he has an Islamic and natural approach in therapy. He taught me throughout all these years how to deal with, with, with Muslim patients. Uh, maybe uh, I will ask you to, uh, because I have uh, translated the book of Abu Zaid al balkhi Triple IT made the translation for me, and this was published uh, in London. It was quickly uh, distributed. Then a Norwegian psychiatrist read the book and wrote to me, this book will change the history of psychology in the West. And I invite you to come to Oslo 
in our international meeting of the, uh, of the uh, Association of Cognitive Behavior Therapy in Oslo in order to tell Norwegian psychologists about Albert. I went to Oslo in two zero, uh, zero, I think, eight, one eight, or maybe before that, one year or two. And when I was there, I, everybody was really surprised. At that age, somebody is coming with all the things that are claimed to be of uh, inventions of the West, discoveries of the West in the 19th, uh, in the 70s and 80s. Then this psychiatrist, when I went there, I discovered that he translated my book to Norwegian. And not only this, but he published the book. Uh, he published the book. This is the book that he published. And uh, after uh, publishing this book, he told me, please go with me to Bergen. I will pay for your ticket. I want you to go. We want to launch my book in Bergen. And we traveled. And we launched his book in Bergen. It is really interesting. Twelve centuries ago, a Muslim, uh, a Muslim physician was applying cognitive behavior therapy. And the West at that time started, were sinking on this Freudian nonsense, and Muslims followed suit, and they have this in their history. Up to now, I, I feel at times ashamed of myself. When I hear a Muslim psychologist talking about positive psychology, and then he begins to speak Oh, now it is discovered if you, have, if you are sick and you help somebody, this will help you to become better. He only appreciates this after, after the Western world came up with the Western cycle, after this Martin Seligman came and talked of Then he, he, he knows it, accepts it. So we had a number of cases. One of the great works that has been done uh, was done by uh, was done by uh, I put it off until the next one was done by uh, Professor Zubair Bashir. Here he is, the man with the turban and the garment. Here, his book is Psychology in the Works of uh, Early uh, Early Arab. Uh, what is the exact translation? Psychology? Early Muslim scholars. Now this book is now, has become a, a main reference in all Arab universities. It is still not translated. But it is the first book in which uh, the author, instead of all speaking about each scholar by himself, but he goes uh, horizontally. He takes, for example, learning, and then he says about each one, each uh, psychologist have done. Now, uh, this condition, when I am speaking about the past, in the 50s and 60s, when it is not possible to talk about Freud or criticize him. At that time, it was not possible to, uh, to actually come into Islam like face to face. So people who were uh, Islamic in orientation, they went into the field of Islamization. And Islamization, actually, at times, uh, some people think Islamization 
is to keep the whole edifice of psychology as it is and then paint it, give it an Islamic paint. And uh, this, is, this is not uh, proper. And accordingly, I think real emancipation can only happen with Islamic psychology, in which you come to feel this is a different field. It is, a, it is based on different worldviews. But then, this extreme behavior of thinking that psychology is a science, religion has nothing to do with it, it has been shaken. It has been shaken before, uh, before Islamization became uh, strong and before uh, Islamic psychology started. There are about five or so uh, aspects to it that has happened. Five factors. Uh, one of them is the work of uh, early uh, people who criticized Western psychology and its, uh, and its uh, atheistic worldview. Two people were, were of great importance. One of them is Muhammad Uthman Nagati, an Egyptian. Both of them are Egyptians. And he was, he wrote about Ibn Sina. Uh, and later on, he wrote a few books, the Quran and, and psychology, hadith and psychology. Uh, but his work, on Ibn Sina was his, his PhD thesis, and it was actually very pedantic for the common person to read. But the real Islamizer of psychology, the real Islamizer and the first one uh, to whom all of us should really appreciate is Professor Muhammad Qutb. Professor Muhammad Qutb was the writer of Islam, the Misunderstood Religion, and Shubuhat Hawl al-Islam, in which he was the first to criticize Freud, not only from the rational point of view or the psychological, but also from the Islamic point of view. And Professor Qutb, may Allah bless his soul, he personally told me, when I first published this book, a number of Egyptian professors of psychology came to me. Who are you to criticize Freud? Who are you? Who do you think you are? They didn't believe that somebody would come and criticize their, uh, their idol, their, uh, their sheikh, their guru. Yeah. This was one factor. Another uh, factor is that the Western world itself began, because at first they were very enthusiastic, psychology, science, they would come with new discoveries, new methods, but then as the years passed by, nothing happened. The graph for uh, for criminality in the West, the graph for addiction, the graph for uh, uh, divorce, the graph for, is rising like the side of a mountain. Where is psychology? Then they discover that uh, there is a lot of, uh, uh, a number of, of, of cases in which People pay a lot of money to therapists, and they make no use. And that actually, uh, counselors uh, keep uh, uh, treating people uh, without actually any improvement, and, and they do nothing. You know this Rogerian counseling? You just sit down, and you look at the patient, and the, and the client looks at you, 
and you are waiting for him to uh, actualize himself. And then uh, uh, you are not to interfere or to tell him what to do. Religion should be kept uh, away from your discussions. And then uh, he goes on and on and on. And uh, a person who has not, who do not know a, a special a pivot for his behavior, you, want, you expect him to make his own, uh, actually, uh, uh, people, uh, people can come also, they criticize in psychoanalysis people lying down and uh, talking about their history and their childhood and this and this and free associating. But at times this is only dubious and, uh, and, and, and useless. At times people are made to remember things, it is better they should not remember it. From their past they may remember they have been raped as children. They never knew it before. Now they know it, then it, it causes more trouble. Then they discover uh, Ising, uh, the famous British psychologist who was uh, a staunch uh, uh, Freudian himself. Then all of a sudden he discovers it is useless. And he made his uh, great uh, study in which he compared people who were treated by uh, psychoanalytically oriented therapy those who were not treated at all. And then at the end, after giving them tests, he discovered there is no difference between the two. And this like, uh, they call it the bombshell, the uh, I-6 bombshell. When, when I was in, my, in the 60s, uh, in the Middle East Hospital, I do remember, I read in the Journal of uh, Psychiatry, a woman who was a, a, a great analyst herself, writes that she has discovered that all her work is, is doing nothing. At times, it is harmful. And she resigned from the Psychoanalytic Association, though her mother was a personal friend of Anna Freud at the time. And she wrote that she came to this and knowledge after other analysts transferred their patients to her. And she discovered uh, that uh, she has ended up with trying to help people that others analysts failed to help. And she wrote the article with a very nice title, Psychotherapy for Failures of Psychoanalytic Treatment. So she was treating them from the treatment they received. Uh, so here, the West began to, even the public, began to feel. In the 40s and 50s, people will talk about, I have my analyst with pride. They go, psychology, and the analyst will help me. But then they began now to, 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 to be shaky. This was one of the factors that helped us into this process of Islamization. Now this uh, dissatisfaction with, uh, with psychology is uh, writ papers were written, lectures were given, but more importantly, they, it is expressed with cartoons. And the cartoon actually summarizes the, the public opinion in a beautiful manner. I would like to show you here some of the early cartoons of the 70s. I have, uh, I have used this with my students in 1992. I still keep these cartoons, they are nice. Uh, now this is uh, a cartoon about uh, what I told you about uh, Counseling. So he's, the lady here is actually talking about her problems and talking, but still, still he goes away, he leaves her alone and goes to his friend to take some tea and chat. And then after he finishes, he says to them goodbye. And then he comes back to the lady, you see, gradually and listen to her. His presence or not presence is not important. 
she will continue to talk. Uh, this is one of the, the uh, cartoons that make fun of, uh, of, uh, of counseling psychotherapy. This is an interesting cartoon. Here, uh, the, the man is complaining to the therapist about his wife. His wife is fat and aggressive and, and he's afraid of her. So he begins to say, my old, all my problems are caused by this fat wife and I'm afraid of her, so on and so. Now the therapist begins to tell him, you must stand. Look, this what the therapist is saying, and look at the balloon over there. That when you stand against her and you speak strongly, she will be afraid and she will respect you. Look how he's smiling now, he's happy. So he goes beside it to take action. Look how proud he's walking now in order to deal with this wife. But then, the next day, he comes back to the therapist. He comes back to the therapist, <laughs> beaten up by the wife. Uh, so this is making fun of, uh, of behavior therapy at the time. Uh, what I'm showing you here is that this factor of the dissatisfaction of, uh, of the Western world with, with, with psychology as an important element is helping uh, the Islamization. Another important factor was the emergence of uh, transcultural psychology, in which it was found because when Freud speaks about, uh, about Oedipal complex, he says this is found in all the human race. But then they discover it is not. Then they discover even in, in psychological disorders, in uh, a manic depressive psychosis at the time, uh, as it was called before, now it is called bipolar. Now in this, uh, they found there are certain tribes in Africa where there is no uh, feeling of guilt among those who are uh, depressed. Not only this, but they found that uh, it only comes in the form of mania, happiness rather than excessive happiness rather than, uh, or excessive uh, excitement rather than, uh, rather than depression. Uh, they find today that in some cultures, depression is only expressed in the form of physical pains back pain, this pain, it is actually as the person is depressed, but it comes. Uh, Professor Skinner uh, speaks about people in certain areas where they don't seem to have the, the, the psychological disorders that are described in this uh, DSM uh, uh, four or five now. Uh, it does, is not there. In Malaysia also, and in, uh, and in Thailand, there are disorders that are not found uh, in, the, uh, in, in textbooks of psychology. So the way, the, the way you look at the, your worldview will not only influence your uh, behavior, but it influences the kind of, of, of psychological disorders you have and how you look at it and even the therapist, and even the therapist. At times, a, a, a native healer can do better than a psychologist. I was in the 80s, I have been uh, uh, selected to take part in, uh, in this uh, WHO uh, uh, Committee on Traditional Medical Practices, and I was asked to do some research in, uh, in Sudan and in Saudi Arabia. And in the uh, hospital uh, in Khartoum, where I was working, uh, 
Uh, we had a few patients, two of them, I remember them well. We did everything to help them, they, they were not helped. Then I just went to uh, one native therapist uh, south of Khartoum, a few, it's a uh, uh, few hundred miles south of Khartoum. He's a very famous uh, sheikh. And then I went there and I said the best thing to do is to go uh, not like a psychologist wearing shirt and trousers. No, I, I put on like a Professor Zubair, a garment and turban, and I, I didn't tell anybody who I am or what I wanted because I thought I was under the foolish conception that I am a scientist going to observe and to write for uh, the World Health Organization and you. So I went there. So they brought me with all the people who came in uh, that bus and they, they put a big carpet and we all uh, lie down on the carpet. And uh, we are supposed to sleep there and then to ask for a special permission to meet the sheikh and then to observe and write. But then two people came in and they looked at me in this uh, disguised clothes and they all shouted, Dr. Malik, Dr. Malik. They are the two patients whom we failed to treat in Yemen. <laughs> and they were happy, relaxed. They came to this sheikh and he uh, read Quran to them. They are praying with the group, uh, taking food with the group. And also the dua of this man, his spiritual guidance, they improve. They improve in spite of every trial that, and no antidepressant was saved from them. Maybe some of them received uh, uh, electroconvulsive therapy useless. It was only when he touched the right spiritual button that these people have improved. So uh, transcultural psychology was important. Its development was important in helping us through this process. And then the revivalism of the youth. Five minutes? Yeah. So now, this is the past and the present. And the, I will say a few words about the future. I think we are having a bright future. Already I mentioned that I look very positively at that uh, by seeing your teaching in uh, Iowa State University, Islamic Psychology, by uh, uh, the University of Milan here, making an institute of Islamic psychotherapy, by seeing uh, uh, institutes that, that are completely devoted to, to this process of Islamic, uh, uh, of Islamizing and changing the, uh, the social sciences. Also the West itself is changing and this is helpful to us. Uh, now the idea, if you read the works of people like uh, Scott Peck, The Road Less Traveled, in which he speaks about spirituality in uh, psychology. Not only this, but he believes uh, in things which very few Westerners would believe in. He believes in possession, gene possession. And he says, we psychiatrists are fools because we cannot notice this. We, it's out of our uh, courses to think about the presence of Shaitan, Iblis, having any role in... Uh, so, this man when he wrote The Road Less Traveled, it became a bestseller 
up to now there is no book that has been in the bestsellers list for more than 11 years. Uh, also, we have uh, Dr. Herbert Benson of Harvard University, the Institute, the Mind and Body Institute. Again, he goes into areas which psych psychology has not known before. Even cognitive behavior therapy now, they are going into the third wave of cognitive behavior therapy is, is taken from Buddhism. Uh, acceptance and mindfulness, all this stuff. When uh, uh, I read the book, uh, Timeless Healing by, uh, by Herbert Benson, and he says you close your eyes and repeat a word from your belief system and you relax. I, you are describing my father to me. My father who just does this, yes. He comes and takes his tasbih like this, yes, and relaxes, and subhanallah, subhanallah. What, what, what are you saying? This is, we are doing this all the time. So indeed, I think we have now uh, uh, a big possibility. Islamic psychology will reign, and it will become the actual source of psychology. But I look forward to people who are not uh, bound by the system, even the textbook system of psychology. We want to study more the influence of, of uh, the important importance of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his role model. We need to go into this. A silly counselor will come and tell me, be good to the patient, be good to the patient. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, the way he treated people is an is a, a example beyond, beyond human goodness. The last thing I read is that somebody brought him grapes to eat. And then the Prophet take the grapes one by one and eats it. And the man is so happy with each grape the Prophet eats. And the Sahaba are around him. And then uh, when he ate it all, the Sahaba said, Oh, Prophet, why didn't you give us with you? Wallahi, he said to them, the grapes are terribly sour. They cannot be swallowed. I only ate it because I want to please this man. I cannot punish you with, uh, with this. Just the little things like this. So uh, we need now, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِمْتَ لَهُ It is from the mercy of God that you became gentle with them. If you were harsh hearted, they would have fled away from you. So, pass over their, Allah says, pass over their faults and consult them. And then ask Allah for forgiveness for them. And when you decide, depend on Allah. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةِ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِمْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ فَاعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّرْ عَلَى اللَّهِ We need to, to get more in our Islamic psychology about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We need to know hikmat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in choosing his prophets. Why is it that Allah brought Moses as a baby to grow up in the palace of Fir'aun? Why? We need to know this from the psychological point of view. The environment and heredity in, in the choice of the prophet and the way Yusuf to be taken all the way to, to Egypt. Why? There is a linguistic factor. There is a spiritual factor. A number of factors. I'm writing on this subject. I hope I will finish this before I die. Thank you very much indeed.